This is PT Pro Talk, the podcast for physical therapists who want to improve their clinical skills and be more successful. I'm Mariana Parks, physical therapist and your host, and today I interview Dr. Jennifer Stone about pelvic health and its applications for orthopedic therapists. She will give us a brief overview of how to screen for pelvic health dysfunction and the most common interventions she uses, how to integrate pelvic floor into the treatment of patients with orthopedic issues, pelvic floor exercises she recommends, and her perspective on kegels, and much more. Dr. Stone is a physical therapist who completed an orthopedic residency through Evidence in Motion. She is a board-certified orthopedic clinical specialist and holds a pelvic health certification. Dr. Stone is passionate about teaching and opening the world of pelvic health to all types of clinicians. If you find this information valuable, please subscribe to our channel, hit the notification bell for updates, give us a thumbs up, and share with other clinicians who could benefit from this information. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy the show. PT Pro Talk is only possible with the support of the forward-looking and innovative companies like Systems for PT, the Do Anything, Anytime EMR. Systems for PT develops systems for clinicians so you can focus on your patients. Go to systemsforpt.com to schedule a demo today. Sarah Health. Remote therapeutic monitoring sounds great, but also difficult. Sarah Health makes RTM simple and easy for your patients and providers. Check out sarahealth.com slash ptprotalk for a special offer. Hi, Jane. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? Doing great. How are you? Doing good, doing good. Um, and excited to talk to you um, about pelvic health and orthopedic uh, PTs. So let's just get started uh, a little bit talking about yourself and your, your background and your career for the ones that don't know you yet. Of course. Yeah, so my name is Jennifer Stone. I am a physical therapist. I've been practicing um, since 2009. Um, started out in a very heavily outpatient orthopedic setting where, honestly, I always enjoyed treating patients with spine problems, um, SI joint problems, hip problems. So that was always just, I treated everything, of course, as you do, but that was, those were always some of my favorites and the ones that I really enjoyed the most. Um, I did also sort of stumble into a clinical practice where my mentor, just for whatever reason, saw a lot of pregnant patients, which at the time was extremely uncommon, especially in an orthopedic setting. Um, so I had the, the sort of privilege or benefit of being able to learn how to treat that patient population for things like low back pain and hip pain and that sort of thing during pregnancy. Um, and so in about 2012, I had my oldest child and was sort of catapulted in some ways against my will into the world of pelvic health um, because I had an injury during delivery with him. And it was recommended that I go see a pelvic health therapist. And honestly, at that time, I really didn't even totally know what a pelvic health therapist was. I think I had maybe a two-hour lecture at the very end of my entry-level program that was just enough to sort of um, make all of us a little bit weirded out and make most of us, including myself, actually say, that's one area of PT that we're really not even interested in learning anything else about. Um, and so... I truthfully went to my first pelvic floor class with entirely selfish motivations. I wanted to know how to help myself get better because when that was recommended to me, the closest local therapist that I could have gone to for care was a couple of hours away. And as a full-time working professional, new mother, that was not really an option for me. And so um, I, I don't think truthfully that with that first class, I was even necessarily really intending to treat patients. Again, I really just wanted to know how to help myself heal. Then I went to that first class, came back out. Um, and, you know, of course, people were like, you know, how'd it go? Because I was a bit, of course, nervous going into it. And I said, I have two predominant emotions right now. I'm really excited. And I'm also mad. And the reason that I was mad was that I had gone to a pretty well-regarded um, school with regards to orthopedics, manual physical therapy, all of these things. And at that point, I had completed a residency in orthopedics. 
And I had learned absolutely nothing, truthfully, in either of those experiences about the pelvic floor muscles. And the one thing that really stood out to me when I attended this course, which was not at all about orthopedics, by the way, I don't think we mentioned low back, I don't think we mentioned hips, etc. But from my knowledge as a board certified clinical specialist in orthopedics at that point, plus my clinical practice, I was able to sort of bridge those gaps and realize, oh my goodness, this is an entire group of muscles and an entire area of the body that does impact the patient populations that I have been seeing. I've been missing this big piece of the puzzle this whole time. And so then, as they say, the rest is history. I continued to educate myself and to dive in. Um, I was given the opportunity to start a pelvic health certification program through Evidence in Motion, which is um, what I do full time now. And it's been very cool to start the process of bridging that gap that really the the profession has created between orthopedics and pelvic health. I think that unfortunately we sort of set these up in two different camps and there's a little bit of a reputation there where I would truly argue that pelvic health is a subset of orthopedics, not a completely separate branch of physical therapy. And by the way, you don't necessarily have to be a pelvic health specialist to integrate helpful things for your pelvic health patients into your care. And I think that's what's the craziest thing about it is like, as a PT, not even like know what pelvic health PT is. So who, yeah. who else is going to know about it if even PTs exactly. don't know about it? Yeah. That's crazy. And the physicians don't either, for the most part, unless they've been lucky to have someone in their area. So yeah, it, it's an area that is, it has a lot of potential. There's so much need there. And so I get really excited anytime I get to have a conversation with somebody, especially if it's somebody that you might not think of as like a traditional pelvic health therapist. So Yes. And so, so now you are teaching the course pelvic health applications for orthopedic therapies, right? Yes, that is one of the courses that is in our certification. And we actually have now a second certification that is designed for people who say, you know what, I don't want to be a pelvic floor specialist. I don't want to do internal work, but I know that my patients with low back pain, hip pain, pelvic girdle pain have, um, have these issues that are sort of comorbid contributing to or resulting from these orthopedic diagnoses. And so I want to learn how to provide patient education. I want to learn how to screen externally. I want to learn how to um, integrate pelvic floor informed cueing into my orthopedic practice. That's what that certification is about. Those two certifications share the course that you're mentioning. And then also that course can be taken just freestanding as a CE course for someone who just, you know, wants to, to learn the topics. But really what we cover in there is what is the relationship between the pelvic floor and these structures with which probably most of the attendees are fairly familiar? How do they impact one another? So what? why would we maybe want Want to consider a spine manipulation for a patient with a complaint of incontinence. Um, how can we cue exercise and how can we integrate this sort of physiologic knowledge of pelvic health in order to make sure that when we are helping our patients rehab from their chronic low back pain or post-op total hip replacement, that we are treating and referring to the entire area and not sort of just ignoring this one over here. Um, there have been multiple studies actually that have come out lately. The one that I find the most compelling came out a couple of years ago. And what they found was that, so they took a group of people who are assigned female at birth who had chronic low back pain. They found that 98% of them had at least one symptom of pelvic floor dysfunction, be that incontinence, constipation, um, difficulty with other bathroom functions um, or pelvic pain. And so to me, I mean, that did not surprise me whatsoever because that is also what I've observed clinically. But that's pretty compelling to say that if you are in orthopedic practice, you actually are already seeing patients who have pelvic floor dysfunction. You just may not know it because you may not ask, be asking them those questions. And they don't necessarily have a reason to bring it up because our patients are not going to connect the fact that they leak when they jump on a trampoline with their low back pain. And so that's where I think the onus is on all of us really to have at least a baseline 
specified that they're standing to where we can screen and go, you know what, I think you need to go see a specialist or no, this is somebody that I can handle. I'm just going to include some kind of personalized queuing to make sure that we're getting that pelvic floor component somewhat addressed. Yeah, it's just kind of having that base and knowledge so you don't miss those patients that you could help a lot more and you are not. So Exactly. And and when you think about pelvic health, I think a lot of times it comes to our mind just older women, right? Yes. So, yeah. So what would you say about that? Yeah, there's a misnomer out there that, you know, well, pelvic floor problems are caused by having babies and or by being postmenopausal. And that's actually not true. <laughs> People who are assigned male at birth also have pelvic floor dysfunction. I think the the statistics range anywhere, depending on the study that you look at, anywhere between 8 and 30% lifetime prevalence. We think that that is most likely underrepresented because there are a lot of barriers there for people in that population to report some of these issues or to complain about them. Because, of course, our stat studies only tell us the people who co go to the doctor, basically, to ask for help. Um for women, the prevalence is anywhere between 60 and 90%, depending on what study you look at. So fairly safe to say that all of us at some point during our life are going to experience a pelvic floor issue that is significant enough for us to seek medical care. That's a huge number. It is a huge number. Absolutely. And interestingly, now there are some factors that are known to predispose towards developing certain types of issues. However, children also have pelvic floor issues, particularly issues with incontinence and constipation. Um, Nulliparous females, so people who have never been pregnant, also have pelvic floor issues. It's very common in high school female athletes, actually, um, and young 20s athletes, especially in high-impact sports or sports that involve kicking a ball, so soccer, that sort of thing. Um, so certainly, is it more common the older you get? Well, sure, so is back pain. Do you know what I mean? It's, But it does occur all throughout the entire lifespan, and they're really there's no patient population that I can think of where I would feel safe to say, oh, I don't need to ask them any questions to even slightly screen for the pelvic floor. That's very interesting. I'm glad that you brought that to our attention because I think that's not something that most people think about. Most PTs are not looking for that. No, and I didn't that. either. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't either before I, I sort of started diving into this world. The extent of my questions about that was, have you had any bowel and bladder changes because I was screening for red flags for cauda equina, but that was it. Um, and it's really interesting. Anytime I teach that course that you're talking about, the one that is sort of geared towards how do we help orthopedic therapists know a little bit about the pelvic floor and just integrate it into their practice, a really great question I often get is, okay, so the study that came out of those 98% of people who had some sign of pelvic floor dysfunction, about 73% of them had incontinence. And they said, well, but how do you know if that incontinence is from pelvic floor dysfunction or if it is actually a red flag and something that we might need to send someone to a neurologist about? And that's a great question because I think a lot of us just got in PT school, well, if there's bowel and bladder changes, we should panic and we should send, maybe not panic, but we should send people to go seek medical care, get screened for neuro issues, et cetera, which is important, by the way, because those kinds of changes can be the first symptom of neurologic dysfunction. But it also could just be stress incontinence that we can fully address. And by the way, most of my patients with stress incontinence never take their clothing off in my clinic. Most of them are treated completely with external techniques that don't involve anything, any more invasive of an exam than you would do for a typical low back or hip pain patient. Uh, which surprises people sometimes because I think, again, there's this misnomer that like, oh, it's this completely different set of skills or set of treatments and it doesn't have to be. There are some diagnoses that that is needed, but that's not one of them usually. Um, but regardless of all of that, the answer to how do I know is, well, is it recent onset? with no explanation? Or is this someone who's like, oh yeah, I've had some leaking since my child was born three years ago or as I've gotten older. Um, and also the other thing that I think is super important for all of us is we should not be making any assessments off of a single piece of information, right? 
anything we gather during our assessments is part of this large puzzle where we've got to put all of these pieces together to come up with what we think is going on. So if we've got water changes, even a somewhat recent onset of incontinence or something like that, but we've done a neuro screen and it's completely clear and it's looking and feeling very orthopedic, very mechanical in nature. Well, that's going to be a little bit different than someone who's like, oh yeah, their reflexes are off and they've got some dermatomal issues and whatever else. So I like to just remind people, you know, our, our evaluation does not consist of just asking people about what their bathroom habits may have been, although that may be a very important sort of line of questioning to go down with people. Yes, absolutely. And, and what are the most common diagnoses you see? So actually, probably the same ones that you and your audience see, to be really honest with you. Low back pain, hip pain, pelvic girdle pain, or SI joint pain. I like calling it pelvic girdle pain because now our, our research tells us that only a very small percentage of that is actually coming from the SI joint itself, although that is where the pain is located. Um, it, yeah, it's again, it's not going to look truthfully that different probably from a lot of the practice of the people who are listening to this podcast. Now, absolutely, do I also get referrals specifically for things like incontinence and constipation, um, difficulty with intimacy, that sort of thing? Absolutely, I do. But very interestingly, when I get those diagnoses, they almost always have hip, low back, or pelvic girdle pain, or thoracic pain, actually, as a comorbidity, or neck pain, or cervicogenic headaches. And so it goes both directions, actually, where the patients who are referred for those, what we've maybe historically called orthopedic diagnoses, and the patients who are referred for what we've historically called pelvic floor diagnoses, they both have the other one as well. It's all integrated as part of the picture. Um, thoracic spine, you don't have good thoracic spine mobility. Guess what? Can't move well. Your diaphragm. Your diaphragm and your pelvic floor have a synergistic relationship. So if your diaphragm is not moving well, your pelvic floor can't move well either. And so it's one of those things where, again, you've got to, you have to evaluate the person. You're not evaluating a pelvic floor. You're not evaluating a low back. You're evaluating and then hopefully treating the entire person person that presents to you with all of the involved body parts and the psychosocial factors and all of the lovely things that can go into sort of people's experience of whatever they came in to see you for. And it's so useful to have that knowledge because as you said, you're going to be seeing the, the, the symptoms are overlapping pretty much. So you, you just have to have this basic knowledge. So would you just give us like a brief overview of how do you screen for pelvic health dysfunction and the most common interventions you use? Absolutely. Yes. So really the screening that I do starts with the subjective exam, as all good screening does. <laughs> so there are a few questions that I ask everybody. Um, and, you know, I will place this with a caveat that I recognize when I tell you what these questions are, there may be some like, well, I can't ask my patient who came in for low back pain that question. I thought that too when I first did my training and when I realized, gosh, I kind of have an ethical, you know, sort of requirement now that I know this to start screening for it. And I was like, gosh, what are my patients going to think? I will tell you right now that that is an entirely, and for me, it was an entirely self, um, sort of self-imposed limitation. I have actually never had anybody even bat an eye when I've asked these questions. Um, we have a lot of research actually that says people don't bring up issues with intimacy or in issues with bathroom function to healthcare providers, physicians, physical therapists, occupational therapists, the whole gamut, not because the patient is embarrassed, but because they're worried about embarrassing us, which I think is a very powerful statement. And again, they don't necessarily know that they're related, but I think it's a very powerful statement that tells us, listen, there is a power dynamic differential when a patient has come into your clinic to see you. It's on us to set the tone and make it to where people are comfortable disclosing these symptoms that are very much part of the challenge that they're experiencing. So that's my little caveat to this. And my challenge to anyone who's listening is try it. Try it and see. Give it a go with a couple of patients that you either are more comfortable with or maybe someone that you read that's a little bit more casual. And the best way to build confidence in it is just to do it and see how it goes. And I bet 
you will have a good experience just like I did. And you'll be able to go, oh, that wasn't so bad. Let me ask the next person. And then before you know it, you're asking like this sweet older grandma about her issues with sexual function or whatever the case may be. But the questions that I always ask are, number one, do you experience any difficulties with leakage of urine, even a tiny amount when you don't expect it? Okay, I do not ever say urinary incontinence because when people hear that phrase, what they think of immediately is, oh, I'm standing in a puddle when I sneeze. And even a small amount of urine leakage tells me that the muscles are not functioning optimally, which is why I care about urine leakage. Um, the second question I ask is I pull out something called the Bristol stool scale. Feel free to just Google that. There's like I don't even know how many options for like quick and easy things that you can print online. But the Bristol stool scale is just a, it's pictures, it's not like camera pictures, it's drawings, but it shows different um, types of stool. And I ask them, just show me on this what your stool typically looks like when you go to the bathroom. And the reason I do that instead of saying, do you experience constipation is because people think, oh, constipation means I don't go every day. You can actually be constipated and go every day. And so what the Bristol stool scale shows you is like there are several kind of ways that stool might appear that are within the realm of normal and not constipated. And then there are other ways that it can appear that indicate constipation. And most of us have only ever seen our own stool unless we maybe have a very young baby then we're changing their diapers or something. But for the most part, people don't really have a frame of reference for what stool is supposed to look like. So that is a very helpful tool. Um, and then the other question that I always ask anyone, or sorry, everyone, is have you experienced any difficulties or discomfort when participating in intimate activities with another person or with yourself? And if people are, so the one thing that I will often suggest as a way to sort of get accustomed, now I'm very used to just spitting out those questions. I don't even think about it anymore. But if you're sitting there going, gosh, I mean, this makes sense and I'd like to start doing it, but that feels like a really big gap for me to bridge or kind of a big thing for me to start asking about these things. If you do intake paperwork, you can absolutely put these questions on your intake paperwork. And then if, and just say something like circle any of these that apply to you, or you put the picture of the Bristol stool scale on there and just ask them to circle the one that applies to them. And then if they circle yes about the sexual dysfunction, or if they circle yes about leakage of urine, then they open that door in a way and you can just say, oh, I see you circled this. Could you tell me more about that? And then at that point, you'll want to know things like, well, are they having urine leakage when they're doing things? So running, jumping, laughing, sneezing, coughing, that means the muscles are not working ideally. Are they just leaking all the time? That's a symptom of a neurologic dysfunction and so on and so forth. And we go into quite a lot of detail with that um, in that orthopedic um, pelvic health course that you're referencing, which can be taken online as well as in person, by the way. Um, so those are the, my screening questions. You have an excuse to start talking about it if they already put on their paperwork, so it's not... Yeah, a... yeah. and it sort of gives them a heads up that you might be asking about it, right? So mm -hmm. that always mm -hmm. helps as well. And then yeah. there are quite a few sort of tests and measures that you can actually do that are pretty effective at screening for what is the pelvic floor doing that can be utilized during an orthopedic exam with everybody's clothes on, relatively minimally invasive. I would say no more invasive than perhaps palpating a piriformis or palpating someone's chains or subdominus, kind of that level. So if people are comfortable doing that, then these tests and measures should feel pretty much within that same realm of challenge, if you will. Um, and those are taught in that course. I'm not going to attempt to describe them on a podcast just because the, I feel like that would be extremely confusing without you know visual aids and that sort of thing. But just know that there are ways to know what the pelvic floor is doing without necessarily doing an internal exam. Now, it won't be as detailed of information. And so sometimes the outcome of that external screening will be, well, this is a person who actually needs that more in-depth assessment. But that's okay because that lets you know, okay, I'm going to refer you on to this specialist if that isn't you. And if you do happen to have that skill set as well, that helps you make the decision of, is this a patient who actually needs that assessment? Because as I mentioned before, not everybody does. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So you said you have the subjective questions and then you have a few, a few tests and, and yep. measurements that you can, can do. And then how, like, then you have any, um, objective that would be the tests. Yep. And then anything else that you do when you're screening for the, the pelvic health dysfunction? No, basically that lets you know, is there a pelvic floor component mm -hmm. and is it the victim or the driver, right? Because it can be either. And mm -hmm. then it also helps me plan for, okay, so my treatment of a patient with low back pain who also has perhaps some incontinence and that I screened was like, yep, I can tell from this screening that they just don't have a very well coordinated pelvic floor. They don't really know how to utilize it in conjunction with their other uh, muscles that lets me know, okay, we need to integrate some pelvic floor informed cueing into, by the way, a lot of the exercises that they're doing already. So my exercises for my patients probably really don't look that different from the exercises mm -hmm. that you all are currently utilizing for your low back pain patients. Mm -hmm. I have people doing things like bridging and, you know, Sarman progressions and all of these things. It's just that we include a pelvic floor cueing component. And your best friend actually when getting the pelvic floor to function optimally is actually breathing patterns, believe it or not. Um, I always say when I'm teaching, I'm like, how many of us have ever said something along the lines of, please don't hold your breath while you're doing your exercises. I don't want you to pass out or, you know, we're joking. But at the same time, it's this well-recognized phenomenon that our patients have a tendency to hold their breath. The reason they're doing that is because if they don't have a good sort of strategy for utilizing their pelvic floor, a breath hold will brace their pelvic floor, which is not necessarily the most effective and definitely not the healthiest means of pulling the pelvic floor into the exercise they're performing, but it's better than nothing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so actually what I start almost all of my patients on is breathing breathing exercises, getting that diaphragm moving because the diaphragm and the pelvic floor, again, have this synergistic relationship where when one moves, so when you breathe in and your diaphragm drops, your pelvic floor elongates as well. And then when you exhale, your diaphragm and your pelvic floor concentrically lift. And so they're doing like this as you're going through your breath cycle. And what that does is it helps create this phenomenon called intra-abdominal pressure, which is where we get our support from for movement, for our spine, for our pelvis, et cetera. I could probably talk about the concept of IAP by itself for much more time than we have here, but that's sort of the quick and dirty version. There's a really great article called The Core by Key. It's a little bit older, um, but it explains it really, really well. And we also go into detail about it in our courses as well, as well as oh, there's a lot of courses that talk about it. Um, but that being said, if you can get that breath pattern going and then you can integrate that good breathing pattern into those exercises that you're already doing. So let's say perhaps with your bridging, you cue your patient to inhale and then as they exhale, they're lifting up into the bridge. What you're effectively doing at that point is you're teaching them as you're moving your body and maybe having a little bit less stability through your pelvis, because now you're lifted up instead of lying flat on the mat, I'm going to teach my brain, hey, use the pelvic floor to help with this motion, right? Because when we're doing neuromotor retraining, what we're really doing is we're reminding our brain how to utilize and how to coordinate our muscle groups so that they're doing that motion with optimal strategy and with um, a method that is sustainable and works well for a variety of different movements. So it's not about you can only do bridges with this breathing pattern. It is about cueing the pelvic floor and reminding the brain, hey, you got this muscle group too. We do it with the transverse abdominis. Now we want to add in that pelvic floor piece as well. So it's very, very small tweaks to the ways that you are likely already cueing patients in these populations. So like when you are asking them to breathe and coordinate the movement with the breathing, is that automatically like engaging the pelvic floor or you have to cool differently for the pelvic floor? Um, so for most, 
if they're actually moving their diaphragm. So that is the big caveat. They have to have diaphragmatic movement. Many people with pelvic floor dysfunction, especially with comorbid back pain, et cetera, will actually turn into chest breathers where they get all of their breathing by expanding their chest upward as opposed to by dropping their diaphragm. So sometimes I actually do have to spend quite a lot of time teaching people how to breathe, as odd as that sounds. But what I mean by how to breathe is actually expanding their rib cage, expanding their diaphragm, moving that diaphragm, because if the diaphragm moves, the pelvic floor will also move. Mm -hmm. It's a reflex. We can't prevent it from happening. Now, is that relationship enough for everyone as far as like for making sure that everybody is able to activate their pelvic floor? Ideally, no, but it does work well for a lot of people. And then if you want to, so just I have an idea of how would you cool someone to uh, work the pelvic floor with the breathing? How would you say to someone? Sure. So a lot of times what I'll do is we'll start with just breathing. And I'll often ask, so we'll work with people. I have a lot of different cues I'll use for breathing. Sometimes I'll have them place their hands on the outside of their rib cage so that they can feel expansion and, um, and collapse of that rib cage. And I'll cue them, okay, breathe into your hands or I'll put my hands there, breathe into my hands. Um, by the way, this is where if they don't have appropriate thoracic spine mobility, you have to address that because it's awfully hard to move your diaphragm if your thoracic spine and rib cage don't move. So again, it's not a body part. It's this whole body and all the things that are contributing to the movement patterns within that body. Um, sometimes I'll actually give them a TheraBand or have them use like a leash or a robe belt or something like that at home. We'll wrap it around their waist. It's not for resistance. It's for proprioception. And I'll tell them, okay, this thing that we have wrapped around your waist, I want you to try to blow it up like a balloon. And what I mean by that is I don't want them pooching their tummy out and pushing into it just from the front. I want this 360 degree expansion of that lower part of their rib cage and their abdomen and even into their low back. Um, so we'll start there. And then once they actually know how to do that type of breathing, so that 360 breathing, or some people call it umbrella breathing, once they know how to do that, then I ask them to close their eyes. And now, you know, we can breathe without thinking about it too much. And I'm just going to have you do that with really deep breaths. And I want you to try to feel what the muscles in your bottom and between your legs are actually doing. And a lot of times people can actually feel those muscles lowering and lifting with that breath. And then I'll say, okay, so that motion that you're feeling and that you're noticing, I want you to just try to make it do it just a little bit more. So when you exhale, your pelvic floor is going to come up, 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 up with your diaphragm. And then at the end of your breath, I want you to just try to squeeze it up a little bit more and then let it go. So we'll start there. Now, if people don't feel that well, what I'll typically have them do is sit on a physio ball, actually, because a physio ball is fabulous proprioception for the pelvic floor because you have that pressure kind of up over the perineum. And so I'll have them breathe on the ball and I'll say, okay, do you feel how when you inhale, you get a very small, but you get a small increase in pressure of that ball as you're sitting on it. And then when you exhale, that pressure lifts off or relaxes. And so now you're going to inhale. And then when you exhale, you'll feel that pressure relieving just a little bit. And then at the end of your exhale, try to lift up away from the ball just a little bit more. And that tends to work really well. If you're in a setting where you don't have physio balls, you could accomplish something similar with a rolled up towel. It's not quite as good because it's not quite as firm and consistent of pressure, but it can work. And then from there, once they've learned to feel that, then... I really just try to focus on the breathing piece. So I'll have them do bird dogs or bridges or clamshells or squats or jumping jacks or whatever it is. Focus on their breathing and focus on that relationship of what the pelvic floor is doing. And the cool thing is with higher level exercises, if you can just focus on like, okay, I'm going to exhale at this part of the effort, then that can, that's much easier to think about than what is my pelvic floor doing right now while I'm in the middle of my squat. Mm -hmm. And so people are able to really think through that, integrate it. And then the other thing too is once you get to that point, you can start to control how much the pelvic floor is activating by how hard you're exhaling. So if I have someone who says, well, I leak when I do box jumps, great. We're going to do all this pre-work leading up to this point. And then we're going to start training box jumps. And what I'm going to have you do is exhale very sharply and hard 
when you are at the part of the box jump where you usually leak. Because if you have that sort of harsh, sharp exhale, what that does is it flips on your pelvic floor in this sort of really strong lift. Very cool. And, and just to, to be sure, when they exhale is when they're doing the most effort in the exercise. Is that right? It's when the pelvic floor is concentrically lifting or squeezing. So yes, generally speaking, you want to exhale with effort. Some people will say blow before you go, meaning exhale during the hardest part of the exercise. And that means for that person, by the way. So for a lot of people, for example, the hard part of a squat is going from the squatted position back up to standing. But maybe I have someone who says, well, actually, that part's not so bad, but I have leakage or pain or back pain even when I'm going down into my squat. It is totally okay to reverse it and have them exhale as they're going down because their body is telling me that's where they need more cueing to mm -hmm. control their pressure. Eventually, mm -hmm. by the time people get finished with therapy, our goal is that they are equally supported whether they're breathing in or breathing out. But at the beginning, when they're just starting to remember how to integrate their pelvic floor again, they may need some of that sort of scaffolding or cueing, just like how often in the early stages of rehab, we will have people really focus on tightening their transverse abdominis or really focus on using this muscle group. But we get away from that, right, as we get further into the process, because as their brain remembers that they have this muscle group that they need to use, typically what will happen is it will build in this flexibility of like, oh, right, I remember I have these muscles, I'm going to integrate them, I'm going Going to utilize them and we can step away from that really intensive cueing same thing mm -hmm. with the pelvic floor okay very interesting and do you use that basic breathing for all diagnoses like the leakage the the constipation is like the basis for all the pelvic health issues yeah, it's the foundation. And the cool thing about breathing is if people actually have an overactive pelvic floor, which we haven't talked that much about, but that can actually be a driver for pain a lot of times and dysfunction. If they have an overactive pelvic floor, that breathing will actually stretch the pelvic floor and move the pelvic floor. So it's as much as I hate to sound sort of like a witch doctor or something where it's like, this fixes everything. It actually does help with everything because again, if you can get that relationship working the way that it should, that is the foundation for core stability or core optimization, if you will. So that's what you would recommend like all the, the orthopedic therapies to get started if they don't have any other knowledge about the, the, the pelvic health. Just start with that breathing, all the tips that you gave us, and then and, and start from there. Yeah, get that diaphragm moving and then get them utilizing that breathing strategy with exercise. And you might be surprised how much that helps people and how much faster they may progress through some of the stages of rehab. Um, I have actually had a number of patients who, especially with urine leakage, who would complain of urine leakage. And literally, we would add some breathing at appropriate moments to the activities where they were having leakage. And they would come back the next time and say, yep, I haven't leaked with that activity since you told me to do this. Oh, now, really? that does not always happen, yeah. of course, but it can. And it's actually yeah. more common than you would think. And like, do you have different strategies for different types of problems? Like, for example, the leakage, do you give different exercises for them versus constipation versus... Yes, Other, absolutely. Yeah. And there are also different patient education points that are really important depending on diagnosis. So, you know, none... None of us, hopefully at this point in physical therapy's history, are treating people with only exercise or only exercise and manual therapy. Hopefully we're all talking to them about, you know, ergonomic accommodations that they may need to make to their workspaces or their cars or whatever else. Well, there's what I like to call lifestyle ergonomics that are involved in a lot of these diagnoses as well. So things like dietary habits, bathroom habits, how much water are you drinking that can really come into play with a lot of these diagnoses and which may vary quite significantly from one to the other. And certainly, yes, you know, which exercises do I choose? What order do I integrate them in is probably going to vary from diagnosis to diagnosis. Just like my treatment for a patient with low back pain that I think has a radicular component versus someone with chronic low back pain is going to look a little different, but they will share a lot of commonalities. I'd say the same is true here. 
Okay. And then from there, any other like tips or recommendations for the, the orthopedic PTs? If they, they screen for those questions, they, they have leakage or they, they, they have other issues. Is there any basic things that they can do to address that? Yeah, I mean, I think that exercise informed cueing is important. Um, something that a lot of people don't realize that is really important when it comes to urine leakage is that a lot of our patients, and this makes total sense, I know why they do this, but a lot of our patients who have issues with urine leakage start significantly restricting their fluid intake because their thought process is, well, if I don't have as much fluid in my bladder, I won't have leakage or especially the people who are like, they'll say, yeah, I don't necessarily have leakage, but I feel like I have to go to the bathroom all the time. They are probably going to start restricting their fluid because they're like, I don't want to be in the bathroom every five minutes and I don't want to have to look for the bathroom as the first thing every time I go somewhere. Well, here's the problem with that. If you restrict your fluid intake, particularly of water, what happens is that your urine becomes very concentrated and very acidic, which irritates your bladder, which makes it want to get that stuff out of there. So it will actually make leakage worse and it will actually make that feeling of urgency worse. And so a, a very powerful thing that you can do is explain that to people and encourage them to drink more water. Um, my favorite story about this is I was covering at the point where I had just kind of gotten to where I was mostly seeing patients with pelvic floor dysfunction because there just weren't enough people who could treat them. And it was like, I didn't, I don't, I love treating all body parts, but it was just like, I was the one who could do that in the clinic. So it just, that's how my caseload was. Well, one day I had come in extra to cover for somebody who was on vacation and I was just covering his patient caseload. And I had a new eval on my schedule that, or his schedule, but that I was covering that had knee pain. And I was actually super excited. I was like, Ooh, I haven't gotten to evaluate someone with knee pain for a really long time. This is going to be so fun. So I start talking to her and the symptoms she's having are just like generalized aching, no real mechanical kind of components or whatever. Um, and she is kind of all over the place when she's talking to me, not super clear on like how she's answering questions and that sort of thing. And as I'm talking to her, I'm looking at her skin and I notice that it looks like almost really leathery. And then she moves her arm and she has tenting just from arm movement, which is where the skin sort of folds and then it just stays in that folded position. And I was like, oh, Jen don't do it. Don't turn the knee patient into a pelvic floor patient. But <laughs> like, because I had sort of developed this reputation of like, Jen thinks everything is the pelvic floor, which my answer to that is always, listen, it's not my fault that everybody has a pelvic floor. I did not design that system. I'm just the messenger here. But I was sort of like internally making fun of myself and because my pelvic floor spidey senses are going off. Right. And I'm like, you don't make the new patient into a pelvic floor patient. And then finally I was like, oh, okay, fine. I have to. So I asked her, how much water are you drinking a day? And she tells me eight ounces. And I was like, excuse me, did you say eight ounces or did you mean 80? And she was like, no, eight. And so I was like, okay, tell me more about that. So the story comes out where she has had issues with erosion of the lining of her bladder. And she's been on medication for it that was supposed to fix it. For and She's been on it for like seven or eight weeks. So that medication usually works in a week or two. And she doesn't understand it. Her doctor can't understand it. And so when you have that erosion of the bladder lining, your bladder is very susceptible to irritation from urine. So you have to pee all the time. She's like, so I basically just don't drink anything because I have to pee all the time, even if I don't drink anything and so on and so forth. And by the way, I had done at this point a pretty decent ortho assessment of her knee and I could not find anything wrong with her knee, like nothing mechanically wrong with her knee. So I was like, okay, fine. And so we talked about fluid intake and I gave her just some like general strengthening exercises, sent her away. She comes back the next time and I put her on my schedule for follow-up because I was like, okay, my colleague's going to make so much fun of me, but I also am really curious what's going to happen here. And I told him, of course, I was like, you're going to laugh at me, but I made this knee patient into a public floor patient. I had a good reason, but I still did it. And she comes back has had no knee pain. She is off the meds that she had been on unsuccessfully for seven weeks. And she came, she only came back like five or six days later because her bladder lining was fully healed. 
and no knee pain. And it was like talking to a completely different person where she had been like really foggy and all over the place. Now she was like sharp, clear, normal conversation. And so I tell that story not to say that everyone who has knee pain, like their only problem is that they need to drink more water because that is not the case. But there was nothing about that patient prior to me just noticing some of these things and not being able to find a true issue with her knee that suggested that I would need to ask her about fluid intake. And I wouldn't have before I did my pelvic floor training. I would have just been like, well, there's nothing wrong with your knee. You should go back to your doctor. So I tell that story just to illustrate that, again, you are probably already seeing patients who have some of these issues. And like I did I didn't do an internal assessment on her. I didn't really do anything on her that is outside of what I would do for any other knee patient, except for educating her on like, hey, there's actually a relationship between not drinking enough and that erosion of the bladder lining and giving her a plan to drink more water. That's literally all I did. And it fixed the problem that she came in for. That is crazy how important it's just to be paying attention to everything. So if you have like that basic knowledge, at least you can watch for it. Otherwise, you would not even see it or pay attention to. Exactly. And again, not saying that the pelvic floor is the driver of all musculoskeletal issues because it isn't. But I think there are a lot of things that historically or traditionally only pelvic health therapists have really talked to their patients about things mm -hmm. like fiber intake, fluid intake, and so on that actually are important across the spectrum of things that we see if you're treating a human with a body. Yeah. Yeah. And like on the pelvic floor exercises that, you know, everybody talks about Kegels. Uh, yep. So, so what would you say like an exercise wise, like what type of exercise you use just to give us an idea, like just a brief sure. overview of like what the possibilities that we have are. Yeah. So Kegels are actually the least effective way to train the pelvic floor. Well, okay. Not doing anything for the pelvic floor is probably the least effective way to train the pelvic floor. But second to that, Kegels are the least effective way to train the pelvic floor. However, they can be an important part of starting to train the pelvic floor. So the way I like to explain it is what a Kegel is, is it is an isolated contraction of the pelvic floor muscles if your patient is doing it correctly, which our studies say only about 30% of people are, even if they've had instruction. So that's a whole other thing of its own. But a Kegel is really analogous to doing a quad set to turn the quads back on after knee surgery or doing um, doing like some scapular retractions to start those subscapular muscles working. Mm -hmm. We do those things with our patients, but I don't, I hope that nobody who's listening to this podcast would ever consider making quad sets or those shoulder blade retractions, their entire exercise protocol for anybody. Those Those are a start point to help people understand what it feels like when those muscles activate and to start to turn on muscles that people have gotten out of the habit of using or that have turned off due to surgery or inflammation or whatever. But as soon as we can, as soon as we're like, okay, yep, you know how to turn those on. Now I'm adding weight or I'm changing your movement or I'm doing other exercises that utilize those muscles, but that don't isolate them. Because we understand that the scapular stabilizers and the quads don't function in isolation. Like there's literally nothing we do in real life that requires us to just isolate and contract the quads. That's not a functional movement. So as soon as we can, we're like, okay, now we're going to do some straight leg raises. Now we're going to do some short arc quads or we're going to do some squats or whatever the case may be. Same thing with the pelvic floor. In the real world, it does not isolate and isometrically contract. It is always working with the rest of the core muscles, with the hip and pelvic girdle muscles, and of course with the diaphragm, as we have mentioned before. And so are there times when I'll have people focus on isolating their pelvic floor with breathing? Yes, but that is a very short section of my work with them. And the purpose is really just to get it to where they can feel, am I lifting or am I lowering my pelvic floor? Once they get that feel, then again, I'm using the same exercise as the rest of you are. I'm prescribing things like squats, lunges, bridges, um, jumping jacks, squat jacks, whatever the case. Like you can get really creative with it because once they can feel it, literally any and all exercises can be turned into an exercise that is strengthening the pelvic floor based upon your cueing and your focus on how they're doing it. By the way, a really great way to know without an internal exam of 
does this person have a functional movement strategy that is using the pelvic floor correctly is to watch them do it. So all of our patients have, uh, they have their favorite sort of not great movement patterns. So it might be that they like to arch their back and sort of go into a lot of lumbar lordosis. It might be that they like to hold their breath. It might be that they like to really grip with their abs and almost go into this sort of crunched position. If you see people doing that, they're accommodating for something. Nine times out of 10, they're accommodating for not using their pelvic floor well. So if you start to see that, so I've taught them how to use their pelvic floor. We're going through different exercises exercises with that cueing, and then we progress an exercise and all of a sudden they're breath holding again, I know, oh, okay, either we need to cue the breath just to remind them, or maybe that's a little bit too advanced. So we've got to break that movement down and kind of build up to the point where we can do it. So I hate to make it sound overly simplistic, but again, this is not something that is dramatically, my clinical practice does probably does not look as dramatically different from yours as you might think it does. So like what I understood, it is a lot more about integrating into the movements that activation than like thinking about isolated movements. You are just there right. thinking about yes. the pelvic floor. Yeah, because we don't live life lying on our back yeah. doing Kegels, right? At yeah. least that's not our goal for any of our patients. What I want is for their pelvic floor to work when they're just out doing whatever they're doing. Really, the reason that most people struggle to feel their pelvic floor is because under normal or optimal circumstances, it does its thing without us thinking about it. It's automatic, just like most of us don't sit there and think about how am I breathing? Well, now you are because I drew your attention to it. But under typical circumstances, you spend very little time thinking about how to breathe because yeah. it's automated. And so really what I tell patients is what we're really doing with these exercises is we're reminding your brain that you have a group of muscles here that can help you with this. What's cool is once those brain pathways get lit back up again, a lot of times people just are like, oh, now I can run without leaking, even though I didn't work with them specifically on running. But it's because their brain was like, right, I remember these guys and starts just integrating it into other things. It's actually very cool the way that their that people's nervous systems can do that. So it's just making it very functional as everything yes. that we should be thinking about making it functional. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay, I know I had a lot more questions to do, but I know we are almost out of time. Uh, before we transition to the final questions, anything else that you want to add? Any considerations for PTs uh, treating um, orthopedic issues that could integrate these principles or anything else that you want to add? <laughs> I think I would just encourage people to, you know, be open minded, seek out opportunities to just kind of explore or dip your toes in the water. Um, because again, even if you have no intention of treating people for things like incontinence or constipation, these treatment techniques actually do help them to progress much faster with issues with low back pain or hip pain, et cetera. So it's going to be beneficial to your patients, even if you are like, that's, these are not patient populations that I'm interested in. And then the other piece being just the acknowledgement that like you have patients, I guarantee you, if you start asking people, you'll discover you have patients in your clinic right now who are, are experiencing constipation and urine leakage and all of the other things. Yes. Like that you already are seeing these people. You just don't necessarily know it and you, therefore you don't feel, I guess, an onus to do something about it, but you already seeing these people. It's not as if this is a different patient population that like, oh, I should only learn about this if I want to treat this patient population. You already are, whether you know it or not. Yeah. You can just potentially add to the treatment. So exactly. Yeah. And optimize it. And what source of information, if people want to learn more about the topic, is there anything that you recommend to them? Yeah, that key article that I mentioned earlier is a really great one. Um, I obviously am a little bit biased, but the Evidence in Motion coursework is very much designed to help bridge that gap or that perceived gap between orthopedics and pelvic health and really give people a toolbox regardless of what their goals are with pelvic health. Again, if all you want to do is add some exercise cueing that is pelvic health informed, that's great. We can help you do that kind of thing. Um, there are also other courses out there that are starting to pop up that do something similar. So I think there are lots of options out there. Um, and, and there's also more and more articles coming out that are talking about how to do this as well. Awesome. And if people want to learn more about you or your work, is there a way they can find you? 
Yeah. If you go to Evidence in Motion, you can just Google for it. Um, and then you can go into the website and just search for pelvic health. There are blog posts. There are, of course, courses, um, everything from weekend courses all the way to just some like online self-paced, if that's more where you are right now, as far as your availability or, or what you're able to do. Um, I have a bio on there. If people want to read more about me, my contact information is on there. Um, people are certainly also welcome to contact me um, who have heard this podcast. Uh, it is jstone at eimpt.com. I'm always happy to answer questions or try to help troubleshoot. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Jen. It was very helpful, a lot of good information. So I appreciate your time and to come here and share all your knowledge with us. Absolutely. Absolutely.